In this video, we're going to talk about measuring the income of a nation. So one of the things that we're going to be interested in is, is looking at how to judge the health of an economy of a, of a nation. So if I were to give you as an assignment to um, say, try to investigate my economic health, and, and I said that you, can, you need to think about the pieces of information that you would want to gather from me that you would use to figure out whether or not my economic situation is good or bad. Probably one of the first things that you would think of is you would be interested in my income, right? Because that, that's not going to tell you everything about me. I could have high income and poor health or high income and and uh, there could be other, I could have a lot of debt. Um, so it doesn't give you a complete picture, but that would be a good place to start. And, and we're going to do that with an economy. So we want to think about a way of measuring the income of everyone in an economy. And what we're going to do is we're going to use um, something that we call gross domestic product, GDP. It's probably something that you may have talked about in another class. Um, or probably heard about at some point or another. But we're going to think about GDP, gross domestic product. We're going to think about what it represents. We're going to think about um, how to measure it. We're going to think about um, what are some good things and some bad things about using it. Maybe some shortcomings of using it as a measure of the well-being, the economic well-being of a country. It's going to be one of several different measures that we're going to be thinking about. Later on in other videos, we'll talk about measuring the price level and we'll talk about other things like unemployment. We'll talk about things like uh, interest rates, inflation. But we're going to start here with uh, gross domestic product. So the idea here is that gross domestic product measures the income of everyone in, a, in the economy. Measures the income of everyone, let's say in an economy. Okay. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. Essentially, gross domestic product, you can think about it as measuring two different things at the same time. Let's think back to that circular flow diagram that we were talking about in an earlier video. Remember there we had um, a little box over here that represented households. And over here we had another box that represented firms. Up here we had the market for goods and services. I'm just going to call this the output market. That's where goods and services are bought and sold. And then down here we had the input market. That's where the inputs, things like land, labor, and capital are bought and sold. So the output, the goods and services, these come from the firms. So these are the outputs. And the households buy them. So those are things like haircuts and um, salads and uh, tires and all of the different goods and services, economics lectures. So these are the outputs. The inputs are sold by the households. Those are labor, things like that. So here are the inputs and it's the firms that are buying those inputs, land, labor, and capital. The dollars that households pay for outputs, those go in this direction. So these are dollars. We call that expenditure. So the number of dollars that households spend buying goods and services, we call that expenditure. That's the revenue for the firms. I'm just going to put that as dollars there. The firms are buying these inputs and they're paying wages and 
rents and profits through this market to the households. And those dollars that the households are earning for selling the inputs, these are dollars here, we call that income. So it's the same number of dollars here flowing circularly. If we measure the number of dollars right up here, we would call it expenditure. If we measure it right down here, we would call it income. So we can measure GDP. This is kind of the natural way of measuring it. If we measure the income of all the households in the uh, economy, then we'd get what we want. But the number of dollars right here is equal to the number of dollars right up here. And it turns out that it's a little bit easier to measure right up here. If we think about the number of dollars that um, households are spending to buy goods and services, that's easier to get a grip on than the amount of income that households um, are earning. One reason that that's true is that you might recognize that there, there may be an incentive for households to underreport their income because they're going to get taxed on that. And so you might say, well, we could just look at all of the income tax returns of everybody in the economy. Well, yeah, you could, but um, we, we look at expenditure. So you could measure it here or you could measure it there. We're going to talk about measuring it right there. So let's talk about the official definition of GDP. So this is something that we're going to use. I'm going to write this out and then we're going to look at different parts of this definition. So this would be, I need to get this up here so that we have a good definition that we can kind of break apart. GDP is the market value, market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. So let's talk about all the different parts of this. The market value of all final goods and services produced within a country in a given period of time. So let's start with this part, the market value. We're going to be using prices, market determined prices to value the goods and services. So we're not interested in what somebody says that something's worth. We're interested in what, what is the price that this good or service is being bought, sold for in a market. And so in that sense, you can see that, that big items with higher prices, things like a car or a truck, would contribute more to GDP than, than something small like a haircut. Okay. We're going to be thinking about this phrase, the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country. So we're going to be thinking about all of the goods and services that are produced legally. So nothing that, that is bought and sold in the underground economy is going to be included there. So we're not talking about illegal drug purchases or anything like that. The market value of all final goods. So let's talk about what a final good is. A final good is, is the, the final product. Okay, so if we think about a car, that we could talk about the car as the final product. There are a bunch of intermediate products or intermediate goods that go into that final good. So we aren't going to count the value of those intermediate goods. So for example, the tires on that car, we're not going to separately count the value of the tires apart from the value of the car because the value of the car includes the value of the tires. If we counted the tires also again separately, we'd be double counting them. So we're going to be thinking about the market value of all final goods and services. So these are going to be tangible things that you can hold in your hand like a pen. They're going to be intangible things like an economics lecture. Okay. So the market value of all final goods and services produced, this term here, we're going to be thinking about goods that are currently produced. We're not going to be thinking about goods that were produced two years ago or five years ago. So if we're thinking about um, 
somebody buying a used car. Well, we're not going to count the value of that car in this year's GDP because it would have been counted back in the year that it was produced. Okay, so we're going to be thinking about newly produced goods and services. Um, within a country, this phrase here, we're only going to be thinking about goods and services produced within the geographic confines of the country. So we're not going to be thinking if, let's suppose that I buy a car made in Germany. We're not going to be counting that as part of the GDP of the United States. We're only going to, going to be thinking about the goods and services produced within the geographic confines of the country that we're thinking about. In our case, it would be the United States. And then in a given period of time, so we're going to think about the, the market value of all the final goods and services produced within the country in maybe the last year. So we could think about this as being typically a year or maybe a quarter. We could think about GDP for a quarter. Quarter is three months. So you can see there's a lot of, of stuff that goes into this definition of gross domestic product. Every little phrase has a very particular meaning. GDP when the government reports GDP, it is typically going to be seasonally adjusted. What that means is that we, if we didn't seasonally adjust it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to compare GDP from, say, the final quarter of a year to GDP from the first quarter of the next year. And the reason is that there's something that happens there at the final quarter of a year, the holiday season, when people are out buying um, presents for other people and, and there's a lot more economic activity in that quarter than there is in other quarters typically and so what we do is we seasonally adjust that so that you can compare them and we don't need to go into what, what it means or how you seasonally adjust anything. Just keep in mind that, that it is typically seasonally adjusted. Let's talk about the components of gross domestic product. This is going to be something that's important. Um, if we think about the symbol that we're going to use to stand for GDP, it's, we typically use a Y. So this is GDP. Y, or GDP, is going to be broken up into several different categories. It's going to be C plus I plus G plus NX. Let's talk about what each one of these things stands for. So all of the dollars that go into a country's GDP are going to fall into one of these four categories. This C, C is the symbol that we th use to stand for consumption. Y equals C plus I plus G plus, this one's going to be net exports. The C is consumption. This is purchase of goods and services by consumers. Okay. Um, so if you go out and you buy a uh, a meal at a restaurant, that falls into consumption. Or if you go out and you buy a new car, that falls into consumption. Or you buy a new pair of shoes, that falls into consumption. I stands for investment. Investment, we need to talk about that term a little bit. We're going to use this term investment a little bit differently than you're probably used to thinking about it. Um, you're used to thinking about the word investment probably as meaning um, what you're doing if you buy stocks or bonds. And that's not how an economist would think about the word investment. If I, if I were to go out and buy a, a stock, shares of a stock in a corporation, then an economist des would describe that as saving. What I'm doing is I'm taking some of my purchasing power, I'm purchasing an asset with it, with the hopes that that ass asset will appreciate in value so I will have more purchasing power in the future. That's called saving. Investment here is what we call it when a business buys, say, a building or equipment that it's going to use to produce more goods and services in the future. So this is, is uh, businesses purchasing equipment um, or structures. New equipment or a new building, a new structure. That's investment. 
You can also have household investment. If a household, if a family were to buy a new house, we would call that residential investment or household investment. So households can do some of this, but typically this is going to be businesses that are engaging in investment. G stands for government purchases. So if the government spends money to, uh, say, build a new highway or build a, a building and a library in some town, um, that would fall into government purchases. And then finally, in X here, this is what we call net exports. Net exports, anytime you have net something, like net income, then that means something's being subtracted off. Net exports is just exports minus imports. Exports minus imports. So we want to count the things that are produced in the United States that foreigners buy from us. Those things need to be counted in GDP, but we don't want to count the things that were produced in other countries that U.S. citizens import into the country. Those should not be counted as part of GDP because they were not produced within the country. So we need to subtract those things off. Let's talk about what would happen. Let's suppose I, let's use the car example. Suppose I were to buy a uh, car produced in Germany. Now we know that that should have no impact on GDP as a whole. But let's think about how it's going to affect the components of GDP. If I were to buy a car imported from Germany, that's going to show up as part of consumption. That would show up as, as some dollars spent by my household. So it would show up here as a positive, but it would also show up here as a negative. And by subtracting off the imports there, that means that because it shows up here positive, and it shows up there negative, the two would cancel out and it would have no impact on GDP. So if you think about how purchases by a U.S. citizen affect GDP, it doesn't have any impact on GDP as a whole, but it certainly affects the components of GDP, okay? specifically consumption and net exports. Let's talk about just some dollar amounts. Um, and, and so I'll give you some numbers here just to give you an idea of, of how large these things are. If these will be numbers from say 2015. If you look at GDP in 2015, it was approximately $17.9 trillion. Very large amount of money. Um, one thing that we're going to be interested in is what we call GDP per capita. GDP per capita you can think about as just per person GDP. So if you were to take the total income of the United States in 2015, 17.9 trillion, and divide that by the population. So the population in 2015 was about 321 million. That gives you a per capita or per person GDP of about 56,000. It's actually, so per capita GDP is about uh, $55,882. And that's what we're looking at here. If we're looking at kind of a rough measure of the average income of people in the United States in 2015, it was approximately around 56,000. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everybody has an income of $56,000. There are going to, going to be some people with incomes that are much higher, some people with incomes that are much lower than that. But it does give you a place to start. If you're, if you're thinking about the economic health of an economy, this is a good place to start. It doesn't tell us everything. It, it ignores distribution of income. It ignores several things that we'll talk about later on in the video.
but it does give you a piece of information that we can start to figure out what's happening to the economy. If we were to look at kind of how those dollar amounts are split between these components, so this one's about $55,882 total GDP. If you look at consumption, consumption in that year was about $38,218. So you can see that a, a vast majority of real GDP is made up by household consumption. Investment, about $9,402. So that's about 17%. This is about 68%. Almost 70% of GDP falls into consumption. Not quite 20%, 17% falls into investment. About 18%, 9,919 falls into government purchases. So you can see that in terms of GDP, about close to $10,000 of GDP, about 18% of per capita GDP is government spending per person. And then net exports is about negative $1,657, about negative 3%. All that means is that our imports were bigger than our exports in 2015. Don't let that negative sign bother you there. So that gives you an idea of kind of what the per capita income is in the, in the United States, at least in 2015. Um, what we need to do now is think about how useful this is. This is actually what we call nominal GDP. And it turns out that nominal GDP is, is kind of limited in terms of how useful it is to us. What we're really going to be after is what we call real GDP. So what we need to do is clear this off and then we'll talk about the difference between real and nominal GDP. Let's think about what happens if total spending by households went up from one year to the next. So if we were to have an increase in GDP, an increase in GDP as measured by household expenditure, then that increase in GDP could be coming from one of two different places or maybe both. It could be that there's more goods and services being produced, so a higher output of goods and services. Or it could be that there's the same amount of goods and services, but that they're being bought and sold at higher prices. So it could be an increase in the overall level of prices. We're interested in separating out these two effects. We want to know how much of the increase in GDP is due to an increase in output and how much of it is due to an increase in the overall level of prices. So let me give you an example of, of how this would work. Let's suppose that I told you that you had $100 to spend, your income is $100, and the price of an ice cream cone is $1. That means that you could buy 100 ice cream cones. Now let's suppose that we change your income to $200, but we also change the price of ice cream cones to $2. Well, so now we've had a change in the level of prices. Your income doubled, the price of an ice cream doubled, but if we were to think about what happened to your real income, if you've got $200 and an ice cream cone costs $2, you can still only buy 100 ice cream cones. So in terms, in terms of the real amount of goods and services that you can buy, nothing has changed for you. So what we want to do is be able to separate, separate out how much stuff is actually being bought and sold versus the prices at which that stuff is being bought and sold at. Okay? And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to think about what we call real GDP. Real GDP is going to separate out the level of prices. Real GDP is going to tell us how the real amount of output of goods and services is changing. So 
we're going to, in order to calculate real GDP, what we're going to be doing is picking a level of prices and then evaluating the output from one year to the next at that constant level of prices. We're not going to be allowing price to change. And that might not mean much to you right now, but I think here right now we'll do an example and you'll see that it's actually very, very easy to, to understand. So let's do a numerical example. Let's calculate nominal GDP, then we'll calculate real GDP, and then we'll calculate a measure of the overall level of prices that we're going to call the GDP deflator. We'll get to that here in a second. But let's pretend in our economy that we only have two goods. If we were calculating the GDP for the U.S. economy, there are going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different goods and services that consumers buy in a year. We don't, obviously, we don't want anything even remotely close to that. So we're going to pretend like there are only two goods that can be bought in our simple economy. Let's suppose they're hot dogs and hamburgers. And let me give you some prices. Um, let's suppose that we have, uh, let's talk about some years. And I'm going to use, in terms of my years, I'm going to use um, past years. We could think about making a, an example where we have current years, but I want you to be comfortable with the idea that we don't need current years. We can think about GDP for any year in the past if we want it. So let's use 2001, 2002, 2003. Let's think about the, some prices. So let's think, actually, let's think about some quantities. Let's think about the quantity of uh, hot dogs. Then we'll think about the price of hot dogs. I don't know if you can read that on the video there. Let's think about the quantity of hamburgers. I'm just going to put H there for hamburgers and the price of hamburgers. I guess I've got hot dogs and hamburgers, so let's call this uh, HB for hamburgers. So let me give you some numbers here for the quantities for each year and the prices. Let's suppose that in terms of quantities, in 2001, let's suppose that there were 100 hot dogs, 2002, 150, and 2003, 200. That's how many hot dogs were produced in those three years. Let's suppose the prices, $1, $2, and $3. For hamburgers, let's have, uh, let's say 50 in 2001, um, 100, and then 150. And prices for hamburgers, let's suppose in 2001, it's $2, then 3, then 4. So this tells us the economic activity in this economy in terms of the two goods that they are produced in the economy, and it also tells us the prices that they're being bought and sold for. So now let's calculate nominal GDP. Nominal GDP, remember, is the market value of all the final goods and services produced within the country in a given period of time, typically a year. So let's think about GDP in 2001. There was 100 hot dogs, each bought and sold for a dollar. That's $100 worth of hot dogs. And then 50 hamburgers, each bought and sold for $2 each. That's also $100 worth of hamburgers. So that's $200 worth of goods and services. Let's write that out. So let's do nominal GDP. And let's do that for 2001, 2002, 2003. So we've got... 100 hot dogs times $1 plus 50 hamburgers times $2. That gives us a nominal GDP in 2001 of $200. 2002, we have a quantity of hot dogs, 150 times the price, which is $2 plus 100 times $3. It's $300 worth of hot dogs, $300 worth of hamburgers. That's $600. 2003, we've got 200 hot dogs times the price, which is three, plus 150 
hamburgers times the price, which is four, that gives us 600 plus 600, that's $1,200 worth of hot dogs and hamburgers in 2003. So if we look at the difference between 2001 to 2002, we see that nominal GDP tripled. It went from 200 to 600 dollars. Remember, GDP is our measure of income, so it looks like income has gone up dramatically. And then from 2002 to 2003, income doubled again. The problem with this is that this is nominal GDP, and nominal GDP includes changes in output, which is certainly happening here, but also changes in prices, which is also happening. The prices are going up. So what we want to do is we want to calculate real GDP. So let's think about how we're going to calculate real GDP. Real GDP is going to tell us how much is output going up. We want to eliminate the fact that price is changing. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to choose what called a base year. Our base year, let's use for our example, let's use 2001 as our base year. We'll, we'll use the first year. We don't have to. We could use 2002 or 2003, or we could use some other year, 1997 if we wanted to. What we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the value of the hamburgers and hot dogs at the prices that existed in 2001. So the only prices that we're going to use will be the price of a hot dog in 2001, which is $1, and the price of a hamburger in 2001, which is $2. So now let's calculate real GDP for 2001, 2002, and 2003. So we're going to use the quantities from each year and the prices from 2001. So in 2001, it's going to look the same as it did up here. It's going to be 100 hot dogs times the price of hot dogs in 2001, which is 1, plus the quantity of hamburgers, 50, times the price in 2001, which is 2. That gives us $200 in real income, real GDP, in 2001. Notice that real GDP and nominal GDP are both equal to each other, in 2001, they're always going to be equal in your base year because you're using the prices from that year. Now let's do 2002. So we're going to use the quantities from 2002, but the prices from 2001. So that's going to be 150 hot dogs times the price, which is 1, plus 100 hamburgers times the price in 2001, which is 2. That gives you 150 plus 200, that's $350. That's what real GDP looks like in 2002. Now let's do 2003. Quantity in 2003 is 200 times the price in 2001, which is still one, plus the quantity of hamburgers, which is 150 times the price of hamburgers, which is two, that's 200 plus 300, that gives us $500 of real GDP in 2003. So you can see that these numbers for real GDP show us that real income is going up, but not by nearly as much as what nominal GDP made it look like. So in terms of the real quantities of goods and services, real output of goods and services, it is rising from 2001 to 2002 and then to 2003. What we need to do now is think about developing a way of measuring the change in prices. And we're going to do that by using something that we call the GDP deflator. GDP deflator. The GDP deflator is something that we call a price index. And we're going to talk about another price index that you've probably heard about later on in this class called the consumer price index, the CPI. The CPI and the GDP deflator essentially are doing the same thing. They do it slightly differently from each other. But GDP, the GDP deflator is a way of measuring how prices change from one year to the next. So here's how we're going to calculate the GDP deflator. Let me write the definition right down here.
the GDP deflator looks like this. It's nominal GDP. divided by real GDP, multiplied by 100. The GDP deflators, nominal GDP, divided by real GDP, multiplied by 100. So let's figure out the GDP deflator for our three years. So let's do that right up here, GDP deflator. 2001, 2002, 2003. So in 2001, nominal GDP is 200 divided by real GDP in 2001, which is also 200, multiplied by 100. That gives us a deflator. These cancel out, may become one. That gives us a GDP deflator of 100. The GDP deflator is always going to be 100 in your base year. Okay, so that's a good way to just kind of double check that you've made the calculation correctly. In 2002, our nominal GDP was 600 divided by our real GDP, which is 350. We multiply by 100. That gives us a GDP deflator of 171. And then in 2003, our nominal GDP is 1,200 divided by our real GDP of 500 multiplied by 100. That gives you a GDP deflator of 240. So there's what our GDP deflator looks like in each year. What we need to do is think about what the GDP deflator tells us. How do we interpret it? The GDP deflator is a price index. Let's just write that up here. It's a price index. And the way that you use a price index is that it tells you how much prices are changing. Okay, so the GDP deflator tells us what's happening to the overall level of prices from one year to the next. The way that you interpret this is if the GDP deflator goes from 100 to 171. So if we're thinking about the change in prices from 2001 to 2002, it's telling us that prices changed by 71%. There was a 71% increase in price level from 2001 to 2002. If we thought about 2001 to 2003, then this tells us that there was a 140% increase in the price level from 2001 to 2003. So if you're starting with the base year and moving to any other year, the, you can just subtract the base year number, 100, from whatever number you're comparing to, 171, minus 100 would be 71. That tells you you've got 71% inflation. Let's talk about how to do it if we were going from 2002 to 2003, because now neither one of them are 100. Let's talk for just a second about calculating a percent change. So a percent change, we'll come back and just briefly review this in the video where we talk about the CPI, but a percent change, the way you calculate the percent change in anything is to look at how much it changed by, how much it changed, that's your numerator, and divide by the starting point, and then multiply by 100. So let's do that for 2001 to 2002. Okay, so if we had 2001 to 2002, our numerator, let's write it this way, the percent change is going to be how much it changed by. Well, it changed by 71. We would take 171 minus 100, 
That's how much it changed by. We're going to divide by the starting point, which was 100, and then we multiply by 100. That gives you 71%. So if you calculate the percent change from 100 to 171, and you use the, way, the normal way of calculating a percent change, you get 71%. So you could, this is kind of the long way. As long as your first year is the base year, you can just use that little trick of knowing that that's going to be 71%. But if we're going from 2002 to 2003, let's do that one real quick. 2002 to 2003, if we calculate the percent change there, percent change, then it's going to be 240 minus 171. We're going to divide by where we started, which is 171, and multiply by 100. And you can see that that's not going to be equal to the difference between 171 and 240. Okay, so you have to be careful. If you're, if you're comparing two years and one of them is not the base, neither one of them are the base year, the first one's not the base year, base year, then you have to calculate your percent change. If the first year is the base year, you can just look at how much it changed by. So that's how we would interpret what the GDP deflator tells us. It's telling us essentially the inflation rate. It's telling us how much the level of prices has changed. Let's clear this off and then we'll talk about another way to think about this GDP deflator. I'll, I'll explain what the word GDP deflator, or that phrase, actually means. So let's clear this off and then we'll take a look at that. Let's talk for just a second about where the term GDP deflator comes from. Let's look at the definition. So the GDP deflator is calculated by taking nominal GDP dividing by real GDP, and then we've got that 100 out there. That's how you calculate the GDP deflator. Well, if I simply switch the location of these two terms, I can rewrite this algebraically the same way, this way. Real GDP, let's write that out. Real GDP is equal to nominal GDP divided by the GDP deflator, multiplied by 100. So you can see that what the deflator does, if you've got nominal GDP, and you divide nominal GDP by that deflator, and then multiply by the 100, it, it sucks out the effect of changes in prices. The problem with nominal GDP is it's inflated by changes in prices as well as changes in quantity of output. So the deflator simply deflates nominal GDP down to real GDP. So hopefully that gives you some idea of why we call it the deflator. If you start with nominal, divide by the deflator, then what you're left with is real GDP, which is what we're really interested in. Real GDP we're really interested in how many ice cream cones we can buy. It really doesn't matter what our nominal income is and the nominal price of an ice cream cone. What we want to know is, well, at the end of the day, how many ice cream cones can we buy? If you look at, at real GDP and how it's changed over time, what you tend to see that is that at least in the U.S., since around, say, the mid-60s, since the mid-60s, we've had, um, let's say, somewhere around 3% growth. And what that results in is that GDP has approximately quadrupled since the mid-60s in the United States. In other words, real incomes have quadrupled within just a few generations. That's, that's fairly remarkable in terms of how much the standard of living has risen over time. Um, 
what we see is that growth is not constant. There are some years when it's higher, some years when it's lower, some years when it can turn negative. Um, so there are years when we have expansions, years when we have uh, recessions. But if you look at kind of the average level, it's been somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, one useful thing that um, at the rule of 72, the rule of 72 simply says that you can take 72, divide it by the growth rate, and that tells you approximately the number of years before a dollar amount will double. So if we've got 3% growth, you can take 72 divided by 3, and that'll tell you the number of years before real GDP is going to double. And you can see that if we had 1% growth, 72 divided by 1 gives you 72. At 1% growth, it would take 72 years before standards of living doubled. At 2% growth, if we took 72 divided by 2, that's what, uh, 36? Then it would take only 36 years for standards of living to double. 3% growth, 72 divided by 3, you can see that it's taking fewer and fewer years for standards of living to double. Here's what that means. The difference between 1% growth and 2% growth is not 1%. The difference between 1% growth and 2% growth is 100% growth, more growth at 2% than there is at 1%. So small changes in the growth rate have huge implications on how long it takes for standards of living to double. So don't be fooled into thinking that, uh, well, okay, you know, if, if we have some policy that's going to reduce the growth rate of real GDP by, by only 1%, that's not that big of a deal. It's just 1%. That's huge. Okay, and we'll talk about that later on in, in other videos. We'll talk about what influences the rate of growth of GDP. For now, we'll leave that right there. Let's talk about a definition. So if you have two, I mentioned the word recession. A recession has a technical definition. It's two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Okay? Two consecutive quarters, six months. Um, it's typically accomp accompanied by other things that we don't like to have, like rising unemployment and um, increased bankruptcies and uh, falling profits for firms. We'll talk more about that um, later on. Let's finish this up by talking about things that are ignored by GDP. So GDP is a good place to start. And there are lots of people that will criticize economists for focusing on GDP. And maybe some of that criticism is warranted, but economists will always point out that's not by any means the, the full story. I mean, there, GDP is designed to be a measure of the income of everybody in the economy, but that doesn't mean that that's all that an economist would look at to gauge the health of an economy. So let's talk about some of the things that are ignored by GDP. It ignores a whole variety of things that it's just simply not designed to measure. So it ignores things like the quality of education. So if we're thinking about looking at GDP of an economy and GDP is high, but the quality of the education system is low, then that's something we would need to take into consideration. It ignores the, uh, the health of people, say specifically health of children. So we would never advocate just focusing on increasing real GDP at the expense of the health of people in the economy. Um, GDP, all other things, we would rather have GDP be higher than lower, all other things equal. But that's not saying that doesn't mean, that doesn't imply that economists don't care about things like this. GDP simply does not take that into consideration. It doesn't, 
have anything to tell us about, say, the quality of the culture. Or, say, the quality of the environment. So if we were, we would not advocate for policies that, that increase GDP at the expense of a lot of environmental degradation. Okay. Uh, it ignores, let's say, equity. It's not designed to measure that. So when we looked at GDP per capita, and it was roughly $56,000 in 2015, that doesn't tell us anything about who has big shares of the pie and who has a small share of the pie. So that's a discussion that we can have. We need to think about that and think about policies that might help people that for whatever reason have a small share of the pie. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about activity that doesn't take place in a market. Activity outside of a market. Let's just say outside of markets. The one that I'm thinking of in particular here would be, say, activity like uh, raising a household, raising kids. It would get counted if kids are going to daycare, but let's suppose you have a parent that's staying at home raising kids. That is a very productive thing to be doing. It's probably, I would argue, one of the more important things that, that people do is to raise their kids. And yet, because that takes place outside of a market, that kind of activity is ignored by GDP. And so we just have to keep that in mind. We can look at the number that we get when we calculate per capita GDP, but we always have to remind ourselves that it's not telling us the full picture. It's, it's telling us one little piece of the picture, and we have to look at a whole lot of other things before we start making a judgment about whether or not the economy is in good shape or bad shape. But that's really what we're doing in this class, is we're thinking about um, different ways of looking at what, what are the things that we should look at if we're trying to figure out the health of the economy. And this is just the first piece of that puzzle. We'll talk about other pieces in uh, later videos. I'll see you then.